in the thick forests of the Pacific Northwest, one would expect to encounter a deer, maybe even a bear. But what if you stumbled upon something else? Something so alien and terrifying that it turned a carefree evening into a life-altering horror. I'm Carol Ann, and welcome to The In-Between. Today is a special treat. We are going to share three true and terrifying stories submitted by in-between subscribers who reached out to us with stories to tell. Tales that will shatter your perception of what is real and what lies beyond. And as an extra special bonus, the artwork used on the first story title screen comes from another subscriber, Andrew. So pay special attention to that. So without further ado, let's dive right into your stories. This subscriber story comes from our very avid fan named Deb, and the story is about something that happened years ago to her brother Frank when she and her family were living in the Pacific Northwest. Now, Frank was a straight A student, a genius in his own right. But as a junior, he decided parties were just too cool and his attendance was a must. So on this fateful Friday night, just before 11 p.m., he slips out his bedroom window and into the night. He's walking along the deserted country highway, noticing a car approaching from behind him. He ducks into the trees, waiting for the car to pass. This repeats a few more times, and he decides, screw this, I'm going to walk through the trees. After walking about a mile through the forest, Frank is realizing that in his effort to avoid trees and such, his path is not as straight as he believed, and he has strayed quite a distance into the forest from the road. Just then, he spots a faint light to his side. While still walking, he turns his head to get a better look at the light and bumps into something, something warm. Something that breathes heavily and shakes uncontrollably. He turns forward again to discover he's walked right into a deer's hind end. And he just stands there with his mind spinning, wondering what on earth is happening? Why is this deer just standing here and why didn't it run when I bumped into it? Then he focuses on its face. It's staring straight ahead, unblinking. So Frank follows its gaze. To his horror, he sees a figure straight from a nightmare. It's so pale, it seems to emit a soft glow. It appears to be a cross between a human and a praying mantis. Long, oddly bent arms and legs, dark, soulless black eyes, so widely spaced they are almost on the sides of its head. It starts to produce a low, rhythmic clicking noise. And Frank hears noises behind him to his left and his right. He is standing there as frozen as the deer. But then the creature turns its head almost 180 degrees, staring at him. And this scares him out of his trance. He slaps the deer's behind and yells for it to go, go, go! The deer bolts, and Frank spins around, heading for the road. He's crashing into trees and thorns and heavy brush, but he keeps pushing through because he understands his life depends on it. However, in the dark, he doesn't spot a small hole in his path, and his foot goes crashing right down into the hole, and Frank hears the snap of his ankle. But even that doesn't halt him. He hears that clicking sound approaching him from several directions just behind him. He breaks through the tree line at last, limping into the middle of the road. He turns toward the forest, standing there trying to catch his breath as he hears these creatures all screeching and clicking. He's so scared that he doesn't even register the headlights coming straight Luckily, yet not so luckily, it's his dad, and he's furious. Frank dives into the truck fast and slumps to the floorboard, sobbing. 
His dad is so stunned that he just stares at Frank, asking repeatedly, what's happening? Eventually, in a scream filled with terror, Frank yells, go, just go. His dad shifts the truck into gear, his foot on the gas, just as he sees a white face peeking out of the brush next to the truck. Needless to say, he floors it and reaches home in record time. Deb is awakened by the chaos when they arrive home. His dad starts shouting at his mom to go get the first aid kit and to get an ice pack. And it isn't long before they figure out that Frank's ankle is broken and take him to the ER. Deb had never heard of crawlers before, and it wasn't until years later that she started reading similar tales on the internet. She always believed him, though. You can't fake that kind of terror. And Frank never spoke of it again to the day he died, afraid that if he did, it might come back. If you are enjoying this journey into the strange and terrifying, please do us a solid by hitting that like button. That one tiny action may not seem like much, but it is a powerful way to ask YouTube to give a little channel some love. Now, back to the stories. This super strange story comes from our subscriber named Rodolfo about what happened over 60 years ago to his father, Rudolph. The story takes place back in the 1960s in the northern countryside of Costa Rica in a rural town called Platanar, when Rudolph is 14 years old. Back then, the town doesn't have any electricity. The main road, which sees very little actual car traffic, is made of stone, not pavement. And there are only a few houses here and there, usually a good hundred yards apart from each other. Because of the lack of electricity, once it gets dark, people use candles or kerosene lamps to light their houses. They have battery-powered flashlights, but they usually only use those for things like night hunting or when they have to venture outside for longer distances where kerosene lamps aren't practical. Rudolph's grandmother, Tessa, is a devout Catholic woman who has some figurines of different saints that she prays to every day and keeps a kerosene lamp continually burning for them as kind of a perpetual adoration and would never forgive herself if the light ever went out. So one night, when the kerosene lamp is low on kerosene, she starts to panic. She calls Rudolph and tells him, Take this money and grab the flashlight. Go as quick as you can to the convenience store and get more kerosene before the store closes. Rudolph hates making these runs, especially at night because the neighboring farmers down the road have these vicious dogs that scare the crap out of him. But in those days, kids obeyed their elders. So he does what he's told and heads out for the convenience store. The store is isn't that far, only about a mile, but Rudolph's on foot. He walks in the middle of the gravel road, hoping that it will give him a few extra seconds of warning if any of those dogs are in a bad mood today. The moon is out, but there are clouds as well, so it's kind of going in and out. And despite the fact that he didn't want to go to begin with, he makes it to the store and buys the kerosene without any issues. However, on his way back home, things get weird. As he's walking, Rudolph has to walk in front of the property of a woman alleged to be a witch. Rudolph couldn't care less about this lady and whether she's a witch or not. He always just kind of figured that her bad reputation was just gossip from the townspeople who have nothing better to do. Rudolph isn't worried about fairy tales of witches. He's worried about those damn dogs. So his mind is not on anything remotely paranormal. Every fiber of his being is on high alert for those dogs. But as soon as Rudolph walks by the so-called witch's house, his flashlight, which had fresh batteries, dies on him. This leaves him in the middle of this rural road in pitch darkness. He tries to turn the flashlight on and off again a few times, but that doesn't work. It's still dark. So he waits a minute or two so his eyes can adjust to the dark. It's pretty close to home, 
maybe a couple hundred yards away, and he knows that road like the back of his hand. He thinks to himself, well, I'm almost home now. I'm pretty much past the worst part of it, so I might as well just keep going, and starts off again towards home. To Rudolph's surprise, however, he runs into a tall barbed wire fence. He immediately thinks, how did I get that far off the road? As he's standing there trying to figure out what in the hell is going on, the clouds move away, allowing the moonlight to light up the ground around him. Now, Rudolph can see more clearly how tall that fence is. It's at least 25 feet high. But it's not just the height that freaks him out. He also realizes that he is surrounded by this fence in all directions. He's trapped in a square jail of barbed wire. He takes a quick look to his right and notices he's still on the road. He never strayed from the road like he initially thought. But now he's standing in front of the witch's house. And he's standing there for a bit, not really knowing what to do, when as luck would have it, he hears a car coming down the road from behind him. As soon as the headlights from that car hit the spot where Rudolph is standing, the barbed wire disappears. Rudolph takes off for home as fast as he humanly can, using the lights from the car behind him to light his way. Once he gets home and calms down, he checks his flashlight. He discovers that the batteries have been switched, so the positive and negative polarities are switched around. Years later, when the witch woman dies of old age, the paranormal events that people reported in this rural town suddenly cease. Coincidence? <laughs> This next story is actually our very first viewer submission. So a huge thank you goes out to MJ for sending us this one. Her encounter unfolds on June 23rd, 2022. MJ and her daughter-in-law are traveling from Boise to Trinity Hot Springs in Idaho. And they're having a great time, chatting and laughing and enjoying their little road trip. And as they approach Mountain Home, Idaho, there are three exits leading into town, and they need to take the second exit to reach the hot springs. As they're chatting and driving, they pass the first exit, and in the blink of an eye, they find themselves beyond all three exits, driving in the desert. MJ says, how did we miss our exit? MJ has taken this road a number of times and isn't likely to miss a whole exit, much less two. She glances at the time and 20 minutes have passed. How did 20 minutes go by in the literal blink of an eye? Needless to say, she's a little freaked. So they turn around, double back to Mountain Home and take the second exit to reach Trinity Hot Springs. For the rest of the drive, the two hardly speak. And Jay is totally lost in her head. She's an intuitive therapist with the ability to guide her clients through regressions into past and present day experiences. So she's determined to figure out what happened to them. Once they get to Trinity Hot Springs, MJ puts herself into a hypnotic state. As she regresses, her mind opens to that span of lost time. She finds herself standing in a void, flanked by two tall gray beings, each gripping her and her daughter-in-law's arms. They walk through an opening into a larger room that reminds MJ of an anatomy lab. There are dozens of naked human bodies on tables, contorted in various horrific positions, with tall gray beings working on them and smaller beings moving around like little assistants for the taller ones. They continue to move through the room past the tables to the front. Standing before MJ is a red being who looks like a stereotypical representation of the devil with two gray aliens flanking it on either side. And MJ asks it, 
What right do you have in taking me? You carry no rights to perform this. The red bean curls an evil looking smile to reveal extremely sharp pointed teeth. It sneers and laughs at her. MJ feels a telepathic reply. You have no power here. She replies, on the contrary, I do. She raises her hand and places it over the red being's chest as it just watches her with curiosity. MJ commands, take me back now and moves her right hand from the center of its chest to the outside. As she does, she sees its chest wall shift to the left side under its skin as if her forceful movement dislodges the heart, lungs, and anything else under its skin. The red being's eyes widen and it emits a piercing, frightening scream. Get her back! Get her back! Get her back! The tall, docile beings on either side of MJ spring into action and grab her arms. They start escorting her somewhere so fast that at first she's walking, then she's running, and then she's being dragged from that place. She can hear the echo of two more times before the doors close and they are in the void once more. That's when MJ awakens just outside Mountain Home, in the middle of the desert, having passed the three exits. She looks at the clock, and 20 minutes have passed. There's no way it would take 20 minutes to drive from one exit to the other, even if she wasn't conscious. The memory of that red being's scream, the only time it actually spoke verbally, still echoes in her ears. This experience leaves her stumped and curious. MJ isn't sure if this makes any difference, but Mountain Home houses an Air Force base. She didn't see any ship or any irregular clouds. As far as she can remember, the sky was perfectly clear. All she knows is that it definitely was from a different dimension. We have ventured together through the unknown today, challenging our understanding of the world around us with these crazy but true accounts from our amazing in-betweeners. Huge thanks to all three of them for sharing their personal chilling encounters. But remember, these tales are not just stories. They're fragments of our reality hinting at the mysteries that lurk between the shadows of the real and something else. And if you have a tale you would like to share, please feel free to send it to me at inbetweentales at gmail.com. And until next time, be careful out there. And I will see you here again on The In Between. Bye.